So friendly reminder to you all to explore the rich content within Consensus Distributed today and throughout this week. Right now, for example, you could catch presentations from the Blockstack community and the Foundations track, and you have to navigate your way there through the Schedule tab. Do not forget that. That's the way to get there. If you haven't already, please register now, that is, to access that and other rich programming. By registering for free, you can also network with other, other attendees, check out sponsor offerings, and do a whole lot more. Naomi. The COVID crisis showed how hard it is to get uh, relief quickly, get relief money to those who need it. And it's also fueled fears of banknotes carrying the virus. Now, the result is perhaps a looming competition between different types of digital currencies. Who's going to win this? Is it going to be government-issued digital fiat? Is it going to be private digital tokens? Is it going to be something else entirely? Or perhaps it could be a mix of all three. So let's bring in Christopher Giancarlo, the former chairman of the Digital Dollar Foundation, and Dante Disparte, the Vice Chair of the Libra Association. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Great to be with Great you to today. Here. Thank you. Now, Chris, you've just come off an AMA in the conference area. I'm presuming in that you laid out your case for a digital dollar. Why should the US create one? Well, there's so many reasons. I mean, there's, there's, as you mentioned in your opening, uh, the, what the crisis has shown us is really the limitations of the traditional accounts-based, uh, analog fiat-based system as we're faced with the need to get uh, benefits to uh, needy uh, persons in the economy to keep the economy on uh, in neutral uh, rather than going into reverse while we wait to reopen. But we're also finding that just money itself is a virus transmitter and we need to deal with that. But there's been so many other issues that have been uncovered over the last few years, the cost and the slowness and the, and the friction involved in, in global remittances as well as international payments and wholesale payments as well. The dollar is um, a key part of, of infrastructure. It's a public good, um, but yet it also needs to be modernized. And as the world moves into the second stage of the internet, the internet of things of value, the dollar itself needs to be future-proof for that new era. And it needs to be digitized and made to be able to be programmable so we really feel that the time has come. As I said earlier, uh, the great uh, French writer Victor Hugo said, there's nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. We believe that the digital dollar is that powerful idea whose time has come. So Dante, to you, with corporate members like Facebook, Uber, Spotify, Coinbase, et cetera, Libra's model stands as something of a sea change from the sovereign tradition of currency issuance. But what can it offer that central banks can't do already? Well, if you think of the conversation and, and everything that Chris Giancarlo said, uh, Michael, um, it, it, I agree with. I think at the end of the day, you need this kind of public-private collaboration to enable, and particularly the last mile um, use cases, the user-directed peer-to-peer payment use cases can't happen um, at the type of scale that they need to happen if it's just singularly a public sector obligation. So I very much believe, and I think the association believes, that you can build digital commons and that those can be leveraged by public and private actors uh, to try to empower people. And, and the last point I would make to anybody expecting a vigorous debate between Chris and myself, um, they may be disappointed because I think the idea here is to really empower that public sector oversight of the financial system and the monetary system while at the same time empowering uh, consumers, citizens, and users to have user-directed payments. I don't think those, those goals are at all in opposition with one another. You I promised a vigorous deb debate, Dante. Yeah, for sure. I was, I was hoping we get fisticuffs or something fun going there. But uh, may, maybe we, we will still have one yet. So, Chris well, maybe, maybe I'll amplify, though, Dante's point. I mean, look, the Libra Project and the Digital Dollar Project are both addressing the same set of issues, and that is the antiquated nature of our accounts-based analog financial system as we go into a digital 21st century. Um, I, we tip our hat to, to Libra be, because it's because of the Libra project and, and Bitcoin that we're having this conversation today. And as a believer in the marketplace of ideas, which is the genesis of all innovation, of all scientific discovery, the marketplace of ideas is what's going to produce the future of money. And so we have a lot to learn from each other. Uh, there's different approaches, a bit serving different imperatives, but all addressing the same uh, uh, concern about the antiquated nature of the traditional 
bank-based account system that goes back several centuries um, and is really going to be challenged by this new wave of the uh, internet of things of value. For sure. Now, Dante, you faced heavy pressure from regulators upon launch. And since then, you've sent strong signals of wanting to keep them happy. And you significantly changed your model and you hired a new CEO who used to work at the US uh, Treasury clamping down on illicit finance. So how can Libra or any currency innovator, for that matter, achieve financial inclusion or other such goals while these regulators continue to put barriers around you? That's a great question, Naomi, and and indeed we we are very lucky to have such an imminent leader coming in to run the association later over the summer in Stuart Levy, um, and someone who I think will demonstrate what we have been saying all along, that financial inclusion and financial innovation and compliance and oversight are not in contest. And I think one, one issue our entire sector needs to accept is there has been over the last 11 years a general lack of maturity around concepts of risk management, compliance, and all the rest. And so I think the Libra project overall and the ability to carry on a conversation with international stakeholders, whether it's the Financial Stability Board, the G7 Working Group on Stablecoins and many others, the more this asset class can gain regulatory certainty, the more we can unlock its true potential. And I think at stake is uh, hundreds of billions of dollars of economic activity. So it's as much about financial inclusion as it is about vigorous competition and innovation. You know, uh, Chris, already kind of as I expected, the whole question of privacy has come up as a, as a big talking point for us this morning already with Secretary Summers making a claim that there's already too much privacy. And he was calling in for, for greater uh, surveillance, actually, in many respects, and to empower regulators. You know, but there are a lot of folks, particularly in our community, who are concerned that these uh, you know, central bank digital currencies are going to be a tool for governments to surveil their citizens. You know, how confident can we be that the digital dollar won't just be some big intelligence, intelligence gathering machine? Well, that, that's a critical question, Mike, and, and Michael, and that's one of the reasons why we at the Digital Dollar Project have brought together an advisory board of privacy experts, national security experts, uh, uh, law enforcement experts, because we think it's critically important that a digital dollar have built into it as a design feature are Western values of an expectation of a degree of privacy in our use of money. Now, even with cash, let's be honest, there's a balancing between privacy rights and law enforcement rights right now, right? Under certain amounts, under $10,000, there's an expectation of privacy. Above that, there's not. For limited purposes, uh, government purposes of law enforcement, and um, and national security, not for purposes of monitoring where you're doing your shopping or who you're giving your political contributions to, but how, but where you're using your money that might violate uh, law and national security. So there's always a balancing in a free market economy, in a, in a democracy between the rights of the state to protect uh, itself and, and to protect uh, its laws and the rights of individuals to spend as they deem appropriate. And what we've got to get uh, right in designing uh, a digital dollar is that balance. If we get it right, and I believe we can get it right, uh, a US digital dollar, we believe, could be a preferred uh, unit of sovereign currency. Uh, Caitlin rightly said that money goes where it's best treated. Right. And I fully agree. And I think that we must make one of the design imperatives in designing a US CBDC getting the privacy balance right. So people around the globe, there's, you know, there's always competition for use of currencies. If you look at history, more often than not, you had both sovereign currencies competing against each other, but also competing against commercial driven currencies in the global world. It's the, the, the last several generation of the dollar's dominance and sovereign currencies dominance over commercial currencies is relatively unique in human history. But whatever the case may be, we believe that it's possible. In fact, we believe it is an imperative to get this balance of privacy rights right in a digital dollar so that the dollar is seen as, as a reserve currency of choice, not of, of, of forced usage, but of choice. So, I mean, when you talk about tech and protecting privacy, whenever you have privacy built into tech, there always seems to be an outcry from government. You have talk about wanting to put back doors into things, want to have access. Um, now, is it even feasible to have that privacy built into a technology? Do you think the government will ever allow it? Uh, and do you think that 
on the other side of things, is it feasible or desirable to trust the government with protecting this privacy? Well, uh, when it's yeah, so look, the, go- the government's got limited choices too because our founders very, very uh, uh, wisely uh, adopted the Fourth Amendment. Remember, all power resides in the people unless delegated to the federal government. And the Fourth Amendment puts a limitation on the government's right to invade privacy. So if it's not law enforcement and if it's not for purposes of law protection, the government's got no right to information. The national sur- surveillance for purposes of surveillance uh, just for the sake of it is, is unconstitutional. So there has to be a valid reason. And what and you can absolutely program into a digital dollar much more um, uh, finely tuned elements of limitations than you can into an analog instrument. But but getting that programming, getting that design feature right, those design choices right, are going to be matters of, of public debate. Uh, and that's one of the reasons we formed the Digital Dollar Project, to have that public debate. And I think if, if I could add to that, uh, just very quickly, I think the area in which the privacy divide isn't crossed and doesn't become uncomfortable is to have the central banks of the world really explore and develop the CBDCs um, and digital versions of their currencies, and then have a very vibrant set of options with low switching costs on the wallet provider side of the equation. So I think it's at the wallet level and at the transactional level where people's transactions and data might exist, and and the CBDC should be really data agnostic and and privacy uh, preserving, whereas at the wallet level is where the compliance burdens often come into play, the transactional records are often in play, and so a vibrant, open environment around the wallets, uh, I think, is where you can strike the right balance on privacy. Well, that's actually a good segue to the question I was going to ask you, Dante, because, um, you know, it's that open source nature of the development activity that I think, you know, could potentially be really powerful in this public-private uh, partnership we're talking about. And in many respects, you know, in the crypto world, the measure of any project's power is the extent to which it brings in external developers and, and has that sort of build culture built on top of it. And if Libra is going to grow, you know, it obviously needs to achieve that level of enthusiasm amongst developers. You know, how are you going to do that? How are you going to attract people to start working on Libra's open source code? Yeah, well, I think notably since June 18th, uh, 2019, Michael, when the first white paper was issued, uh, the code base has been open source since that point, And we're very much committed to that open source developer construct that you described. Um, and part of the burden we're trying to really map out here is that, you know, there there is at all levels a potential tension between having an open source community with low low switching costs and very vigorous competition around the wallets, while at the same time having an entity that is ultimately accountable for compliance on the network. Um, And we want to have that be ultimately a shared accountability between the association and the developers on the network and the wallet providers. And so I think the the open source aspect of this is core. Uh, We really believe that an open, competitive uh, wallet and digital payment environment with no switching cost uh, to end users is key to break new ground and to enable low cost payments at population scale and as a global good. Um, But in order to do that, we have to get through all of the work that we're now doing around getting the licensing in place, hiring the key leadership that we've been describing, um, and then ultimately start to work with the public sector innovations around digital currencies, which is very compelling. But you know, you know what the you know permissionless cryptocurrency community is going to say, of course, right? That on the one hand, you know, this is built upon the initial idea from Facebook, this big centralized uh, platform uh, that you know, th- regardless of where it goes, the narrative is still the assumption that Facebook has some sort of gatekeeping role and all that. I know you'll say otherwise. But even if it is the, the association that's running this, that there are entities that can say yes or no, and that that constrains the ability to have permissionless innovation. What do you say to those? The Facebook control, the the the, the management of the association over access. Yeah, I mean, one I would categorically reject the Facebook controlled narrative. I, I think partly because it's now very much uh, a member driven institution, as we described in the last round of news and the updates to the white paper. I think hiring a, a, a CEO of, of Stuart Levy's caliber also really goes a long way towards, I think, assuring all stakeholders that there isn't one party in this project that has more power than the others, but rather the project itself is trying to design an independent institution that can enable all of these priorities. And I also would say, you know, to, to those who might see a contest between what Libra is trying to do and other aspects of the digital currency and blockchain community, 
I think this is all about optionality. It would be a very, very powerful world to live in if you had the option of physical cash, credit cards, banking, and low-cost peer-to-peer payment networks like the one we're designing. It's the lack of optionality that creates the vulnerability that we now see in our system. And so the advent of Libra doesn't come at the expense of any aspect of the current economy. If anything, it's additive to it, not competitive to it. So earlier you you mentioned Dante talking about the difference between the blockchain technology and then regulating it on the side of wallets, which I think is a is a nuanced issue. And I noticed during the um, the Libra hearings last year, David Marcus seemed to have a lot of trouble with educating regulators about that, getting the message through that these are different things. So, Chris, I'm going to throw this one to you. Like, how do we overcome that barrier? How do we educate regulators? This is a very complex technology. Um, it is difficult to, to get people to understand how it actually works so that we could actually have good laws uh, governing it. What are your solutions to this? Yeah, so, so you know, we've been doing Sociologists have been studying um, human reaction to technological change for decades now. And uh, I grew up on a book called Crossing the Chasm that talked about early adopters, late adopters, and the broad middle of society that adopts technology uh, it's sort of in a bell curve shape. There's no question right now that there are those um, in, in, in the policymaking landscape in Washington and Brussels and, and Switzerland and elsewhere that are up the learning curve, and there are those who are well behind the learning curve, and then there's the broad middle of society. That, that's just in, in, inherent in any, any level of technological innovation, and we face that now, which, which then puts the burden on, on, on groups like ours and the Libra Society and others to do our work educating sort of one policymaker at a time, one interview at a time, one, one presentation, one white paper at a time, to building the case for this. You know, I, I remember um, talking to a graduate student back in the 1970s who was working on a technology called asynchronous transfer mode, known as ATM, which is one of the foundational technologies behind the internet. And I asked him, what was the point? And he said, well, it's going to allow computers to talk to each other. And Chris, I thought... We've got to go. I apologize to cut you off, Chris. No Last worries. Thing I wanted to do. This is fascinating stuff, guys. Um, we could have gone on for ages, but we really are running out of time. We've got a tight TV schedule to run here. Loads to come. Thank have you so much it. to Dante Disparte and Christopher Giancarlo. Uh, so all the best. Thank you. Thank you both. Thanks. And that's all for now from Naomi and I. Thanks very much for joining us. Just make sure you stick around. There's loads more to come. Uh, coming up next, Nolan Bowley and Bailey Ritzel are bringing you Plan B, a dive into the more radical designs the crypto innovators have for a different world. Naomi, thanks so much for being with us. Thanks Bye, so much. Bye, everybody. See you later. <laughs>